Welcome back to Making Sense of Money. I'm Nikki Jancola Shanks, one of your hosts. And I'm Jake Hamilton, your other co host. Andrea Pellegrini has taken some well deserved time off, but will join us next time. On our last episode, we discussed various forms of financial technology or fintech. We talked about everything from digital wallets to Bitcoin to peer to peer apps like PayPal or Venmo. We also talked a little bit about security around fintech, including some famous security breaches that have occurred. Um, This week, we wanted to dig in a little bit more on identity theft and provide concrete steps you can take if it should unfortunately happen to you. First, what is identity theft? When people talk about identity theft, what does that really mean? So it's defined as whenever someone steals your personal information to commit some type of fraud. Doesn't matter what type of fraud, it could be something small, it could be a large fraud. So anything that takes your personal information and uses it without your consent is considered identity fraud. Some examples, there are endless examples of how people use this type of information, but just a few, they could open up a new credit card in your name. They may actually try to go and get medical services in your name. Withdraw money from your account is, A lot of people have had that happen to them. So the range is endless when somebody has that information. What type of information are we talking about? It could be your social security number, even just your full name and birthday, your address, your phone number, any of those things that hackers can get their hands on, they can definitely use to try to commit fraud in some way. So what's the big deal? Consequences of identity theft can be very damaging. So again, endless possibilities with things online, but just a few, they could open up up new bank accounts in your name, credit card accounts in your name, utilities. They could sign you up for um, a Comcast account or their ComEd account. The other thing, that can definitely take a toll that takes a little bit longer to correct is your credit score. As people who have stolen your information open these accounts and spend your money, and if they're you know, not paying exactly what they should be paying under your name, you're the one that's gonna get dinged on your credit score. Mm-hmm. So, you know, some people may not even realize that their identity has been stolen until maybe they're gonna go buy a new car and they need a loan, and then they find out their credit score has tanked because somebody's been using their identity. That would be a, a pretty bad way to, to, find, to find out, out. If, you were, yeah. Yeah, if you were going to, yeah, it's, Nikki, you went through some pretty scary stuff there. I think the one that stuck out to me is uh, somebody opening an extra Comcast account in your name. I mean, I have one, and that's plenty Enough. already. I don't want to <laughs> have to deal with them any more than I have to. So... Um, Yeah, obviously identity theft is is serious stuff, though. And a lot of bad things can happen if someone steals your identity and a lot of, you know, really, it can be really troublesome for your for your finances as well. And some some other scary things, if it gets to be bad enough where people have maybe your social, all your information, right? Social security, your full address, your full name, you can go. This actually happened to somebody I knew in high school he got stopped at the airport because there was a warrant a warrant out for his arrest but it wasn't him like somebody had stolen his identity oh my goodness and it was under his name so like it took a very long time to untangle that right yeah i can imagine <laughs> so also like tax returns you may People around tax time, we are going to talk a little bit about taxes on future podcasts as well. Mm -hmm. Um, But people will steal somebody's identity right before tax returns are supposed to come. So that way they're getting your tax return sent to them and you're not getting it. Yeah. Um, Same same thing with applying for government benefits. If Mm -hmm. you, you know, are Medicare or Medicaid eligible and or... SNAP food benefits, anything like that. Or social security. Exactly. So as as we said, there's endless possibilities and it is a little bit scary, but there are things that we can do to help prevent it and that there are steps to take when it happens to you 
to minimize the damage. How does this happen? I mentioned hackers, obviously, that's a whole, as technology increases and gets smarter, um, so do the hackers. Um, so it could happen online. It could happen using public Wi-Fi if you're working in a space. I mean, I know with COVID, things are a little bit different now, but you know, people would go and maybe work at a Panera or a Starbucks and use public Wi-Fi and not have different protections. People, hackers can hack into you that way. It could even be if you lose your wallet or mailbox theft is still also um, a form of identity theft, which we'll talk about. I'll talk about a little bit later about ways to prevent it. So I'm going to kind of turn it over to Jake, who's going to go through a little bit more in detail about the different types of identity fraud to be aware of. Thanks, Nikki. You touched on a few of those there and all the different things that can happen or ways you can have your identity stolen. You know, you talked about, you know, somebody might try to get your tax returns or open a new account in your name. But there are government entities that monitor this type of behavior. The main one that we kind of use as a, or I use as a resource today is the uh, Federal Trade Commission or the FTC. They have a Consumer Sentinel Network annual report that I pulled a bunch of information from, and it breaks down the all the different types and most common types of identity theft. So I'll just run through those real quick. Credit card fraud is the most common type of identity theft. There's also loan or lease fraud. So people opening a loan in your name or a lease in your name with your information. Phone or utilities fraud. This is what you know we mentioned earlier, somebody opening like a Comcast or ComEd account or maybe opening a new phone line in your name. There's bank fraud. Um, so someone actually getting into your bank accounts and having access to your funds. There's employment or tax related fraud. So again, like what Nikki was talking about with people trying to get your, your tax refund, or maybe they even get enough of your information to get your, your actual paychecks sent to them instead of to you. Or your retirement, like your social security checks. Yeah. Yeah. That would, that's the next one actually is government oh, documents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the next, that's the next column that they have is government documents or benefits fraud. So that would be like your social security. Medicare benefits, SNAP, anything like that. And then the last column is other. So anything that falls outside of that, they categorize that as, as other. And we mentioned those in order of the most common types. So credit card, loan or lease fraud, and phone or utilities fraud are the three most common types of fraud. But I mean, you want to be on the lookout for, for all of them to make sure that somebody's not sneaking in with something that you might think is minimal, but still could really affect you. So what can you do to help prevent this? There are steps that you can take. So the first is going to seem kind of obvious, but people still do it. Don't use the same password for all of your accounts. So your bank account password should be different than your benefits password that should be different than your Facebook password, whatever social media password you're using, the more passwords you have, the harder it will be for somebody to hack into them. Because usually what will happen is if they figure out your password for one account, they will try that password for all your other accounts first. Yeah, absolutely. So if, <laughs> if you're using the same password for everything, then they're going to get into everything right away very quickly. There are different apps and different, I even know like there's journals, special password journals that you can buy to keep track because it is hard in today's day and age where everything is online. So to have different passwords for everything is hard, <laughs> but there are ways that you could help keep track of that. The next thing when it comes to passwords is to make sure that you're coming up with complex passwords. So what does that mean? That means definitely not one, two, three, four, <laughs> but also mix it up. Capital letters, have numbers in there, punctuation, anything to make it a little bit more complicated is always going to be good. Mm -hmm. Having the combination of capital letters and punctuation 
is usually the strongest. Um, yeah, definitely. I think, in, and they also talk about, you know, trying to stay away from using full words or things that might be, you know, related to your personal life, like your dog's name or using numbers that are related to your birthday in your password. <laughs> right. Because if they've stolen, depending what hackers get, if they have your name and your birthday already, they're going to try to use your birthday in all your passwords. So mm -hmm. having something totally random definitely helps. Something else with technology that you just want to be aware of is there's a lot that you can do now to connect like on your computer or on your phone. It's like, use this, use your password for Google to log into all of your apps or whatever it may be. And that's just something to keep in mind because any anytime you're linking all of that stuff together, if one of them gets hacked, then all of them get hacked. Kind of keep that in the back of your mind. It's definitely easy and convenient. I'm not saying that I don't do it, <laughs> but just to try to at least keep track of what is linked together so that way it's not the same password as maybe your bank account yeah i think any iphone users out there probably i'm sure i don't know if android has something similar but you know apple keeps track of all your passwords and so you can when you go to a website if it asks you to log in you can either use your fingerprint or your face scan or whatever and it just pops right up and it's super convenient but it may not be the most secure way to store your passwords. Uh, Nikki, I think you talked about there's like other third party apps that can store passwords for you. And those are, those are always good options for people. The other thing is to make sure you're reviewing all your bank statements regularly. You should also set up some alerts on your bank statements as well. There are different banks have different ways to do that. Some you could set it up for if there's a charge over a certain amount of money, you're automatically notified. And different banks also, I know I personally bank at Chase and I did have my uh, debit card hacked a couple years ago and they caught it like immediately and called me. So they're also on the lookout for this stuff, but it's a little bit different if somebody has your name and your personal information, that's a little bit different and it can make it more complicated. So if you're regularly reviewing your bank statements, credit card statements, and that includes things like if you have a store credit card, make sure that you're checking that statement as well, just in case they're hacking into maybe not like your main source of, of income or your main source of your money, other little accounts that you may have as well. And yeah. that way, if something is suspicious, you'll catch it right away and you can call. Yeah, that's important. Because, you know, sometimes some people, I'm sure, open up credit cards for like a one-time purchase and then maybe never use them again. If you never check that and that's been hacked, somebody could rack up a ton of purchases on that on that card without you really ever noticing until you get hit with a with a big bill and you're like, hey, what what the heck? I didn't make any of these purchases. I didn't buy any of this stuff. Right. And I know too, I've heard from different universities. Some of the universities around the country have banks that you, that are on campus that students regularly bank at because it's convenient because it's right there on campus for them. And then they leave, right? They graduate and they move away and they forget about that account. So they're not checking it as, as regularly, things like that. You just want to make sure you're keeping track and checking all of those statements. Make sure you put your social security card in a safe place. I would memorize your social security number and don't carry it around in a wallet or a purse. <laughs> Keep it locked away. And you should never give out your social security number unless it's absolutely necessary. Obviously, there's, there's times you have to, right? Especially if you're starting a new job or applying for a government benefit, something like that. But if you ever get a random ask for a social security number, make sure you're checking out who's asking and why before you give that out. Yeah, I would, uh, I would say, ahead, yeah, I was just going to add on that. Something that stuck with me is making sure you have something secure in your home to keep all your important documents in. Like a little personal safe, I think is like a really good idea for people. You can keep your, you know, your social security card, your passport in there. Maybe if you're a renter, the, a copy of your lease, just things that it's a safe box that nobody can access except for you and your own home if you ever need to get get into those 
extremely important documents. Exactly. I know growing up, my mom kept, she had like a fireproof safe box, like a little box that had all of our, me, my mom, my dad's information in it like that. And Hamilton tickets when we bought them. Well, yeah, those are I mean, obviously, <laughs> um, those deserve the top okay. security protocols. Exactly. Um, make sure that you are shredding your receipts, your bills, account statements. People still dumpster dive to, to steal identities. So if you're just chucking your account statement into the trash, people can find it and then they have access to everything. This also includes, we all get junk mail where it's like activate this credit card or activate this special promotion, whatever it might be. You want to make sure you're shredding those two because if you don't activate it because you're like, this is junk and somebody gets it out of the trash, they could activate it as you because they have all the information. This is something my husband likes to remind me a lot about to make sure I'm shredding that, that stuff. Along with that dumpster diving is also, I mentioned it before, but collecting your mail every day because people will also just go into mailboxes and take your account statement or whatever may come to get, even if you're still getting junk mail, right? They could get your name and address off of it. Yeah. So making sure you collect your mail every day, even if you don't go through it right away, just getting it out of the mailbox is good. Yeah. You don't want that to build up and something. I mean, mailboxes aren't very secure. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I live in an apartment building and I have like a mail key for my little mailbox. But if you live in a residential area and you know, you've got the white picket fence out front and your little mailbox, you know, anybody could just drive by and open that up. It's illegal, but they can still do it. I mean, all of this is exactly. illegal. But. And obviously, people who are looking to steal your identity are already don't really care much about the law. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> the other thing is to watch for phishing, PH phishing, not phishing with an F. So that means um, whether it's on the phone, through email, or text messages, people try all sorts of ways to get you to click on something or to respond to a question. And then when you do, they record all that information. I know personally, I have gotten in the last two weeks, I think at least 10 phone calls telling me they're from the social security office. And it's like a recording. It's clearly not real, Mm -hmm. but you know, I'm looking for that. And if you're not on the lookout and you get a call that's like, I, we're trying to reach you from the social security office. You're like, oh man, what happened? And then you panic thinking that it's real. And then you click some, you know, press one for this, press two for that. And then all of a sudden they have all your information. So I know another big one that's happening is I've been getting text messages that say that I have a package at the post office. Yes. I've been getting those too. And I, I do not like them. No, I do not like them either. So, you know, there are these big scams that are out there. So just if you have any hesitation at all, like, eh, don't click on it. Don't respond to it. Do some research before, you know, to see if it was it's real or not. Because it's better to do that than be sorry. Yeah, it's, it, it is. It's always better to err on the side of caution with especially in in regard to clicking on links actually kind of a funny story about this i remember when they the agency had signed me up for access to the consumer sentinel network they have like a a big database of of this information on fraud and identity theft and all the other things that they track but the email that i first got about it was very simplistic and kind of almost blank and i just got it from an automated email and it just had this link into it. It said click to sign up and it was from the consumer sentinel network network, which in retrospect, I now know that tracks all of this identity theft, but I actually flagged that as phishing attempt because I was so unsure about it at first. And I asked around, I asked, I asked our boss, Chase Raywinkle, and he sent it up. And then 
eventually got back to me and they're like, no, no, this is okay. This is actually not fishing. This is tracks thing, people who have gotten fished. But it's like I said, it's always better to err on the side of caution. And I know too, like the, some of these fishing attempts, they have gotten so sophisticated. I used to work at the treasurer, the state treasurer's office. And I remember they had actually gotten the name. I think it I think it was like our deputy treasurer or something like they had figured out who worked there and created an email that looked like it was coming from him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all of us, our employees are like, oh, what does Rodrigo need? (laughs) And then it was clearly when you open it up, it like just didn't look or sound like him, you know, and because it was a phishing attempt. So... Just, yeah, they'll get like, any little tidbit of information and try to use that to to get people. And to make it look official. <laughs> so be on the lookout for that. The other thing is to make sure you have a lock, like a passcode on your mobile phone, and to lock any computer. So especially if you're somebody who works, like I was talking about before, like you go to a Panera or Starbucks or something to, to get work done, and you may have to get up and throw something away or, you know, run to the bathroom or, or whatever it might be. You don't want your entire laptop unprotected. Lock it, have a password for it. Same thing for your cell phone. You, you know, most people are like, I always have my cell phone. I don't need that. Like, yes, you may always have your cell phone, but, you know, you leave it on the table and you get up and walk away and somebody can quickly look at it, steal some, some information off of it. Just have a passcode on it. Yeah, that's always um, a good idea. I'm sure yeah. it, I'm sure a lot of people have in the past thought they misplaced their phone or actually have lost their phone. And if you don't have a passcode on it, then anybody can can get in and access your information and that would make that situation, you know, ten times worse than it already is. That's a really good point, Jake, that like people lose their cell phones, right? All the time. Mm-hmm. I mean in the back of a cab or an Uber or something like that falls out of your pocket. And if you don't have a passcode on it, all your information is just there, (laughs) including most people have some sort of mobile banking app or digital wallet. So it's real easy for them. And the last thing I want to talk about is checking your credit reports regularly. Freeannualcreditreport.com gives you normally it's once a year you can get your credit uh, report for free. During the pandemic, they're actually doing it for free every week. I think in through like through like April of 2021, as of right now, just because with COVID there has been an uptick in some scams and phishing and things like that. So just make sure that you check your credit score so you don't have a surprise when you try to get a loan or something like that. Yeah, this year especially is uh, an important year to make sure you're monitoring your credit score and your report. Just so many things going on and people might be deferring payments or in forbearance on some of their loans. It, you know, In addition to all this, it's just this year especially, it's, but if, if you've gotten any assistance on payments or, or loans, you wanna make sure you're checking your credit report to make sure that those are being tracked correctly and that there's nothing on there that should be on there. Exactly. Again, that website that I talked about, it is annualcreditreport.com. And you can can request through there your free credit report. So I'm going to turn it over to Jake, who's going to talk a little bit about what to do if this should unfortunately happen to you and your identity is stolen. Yes, we've uh, talked a little bit about you know, how scary this process can be for people, but don't despair. There are ways to deal with it if your identity has been stolen. I mentioned it earlier, but the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, is is a really good government resource on this. And they actually have a website. It's identitytheft.gov. If you go there, if you are a victim of identity theft, they lay out in step-by-step and in very detailed steps what exactly you should do to make sure you can recover your identity and make sure to mitigate all the damage that may have happened to you. But we'll go through a couple of the, uh, some of the 
the first few steps, and then there's some more specific steps depending on your specific scenario if you have been a victim of identity theft. The first step is to alert the companies where you know the fraud has occurred. So if one of your miscellaneous credit cards, you know, if you have a Target credit card or a credit card to a specific thing and you've seen a bunch of charges racked up on that, you want to alert that company or your bank. If it's been your bank, if it's a, a certain loan, you want to alert the bank that that loan is through. All those things, just make sure you get in touch with the account that has been affected. The second step is going back to credit reports. You want to pre- place a fraud alert on your credit reports. What this does is it freezes your credit reports and basically stops any more credit reporting from affecting your score positively or negatively. But in this scenario, it would most likely stop all of the negative things from happening if someone's racking up charges on your credit report. I just wanted to say that's it's really helpful because if you know that you're, something's happened and it's identity theft, you can go back and correct your credit report, but it takes a lot longer. So if you call to put that freeze on or the fraud alert on, it saves that time to do it on the back end. Yes, that's the important Freeze it first so nothing else can keep happening and then go back and fix the mistakes on it because they will work with you to fix those mistakes. But you want to make sure you freeze it to mitigate the amount of, of mistakes on your credit report first. The third step is to report your identity theft to the FTC. Again, that's the identitytheft.gov website. This is important because it helps the government keep track of these things. And when the government knows what's going on, you know, it can once it has more information, it can help solve the problem and hopefully mitigate this stuff in the future. The fourth step is you can file a police report if you so choose to. In some can, in some cases, the, the police can be helpful with identity theft. It's not necessarily that they're going to be helpful in every scenario. It's more important to get in touch with the people who are running the accounts that have been affected and your credit report. But filing a police report can also be helpful. They may be able to track the person down. And then, obviously, that keeps that person from causing more harm to your accounts or causing harm to anybody else. Because if they're doing it to you, they're probably doing it to other people as well. And it's just nice to have also a record of you, you know, went to the police, this is this report, as you're getting these charges and things fixed. Yes, You also have that. That's a great point, too, Nikki. Um, Yeah, it's, it's official proof that this happened to you, you know, while you're fighting these charges. You know, you have, look, I feel I filed this police report like this actually happened. You're not just going in without any evidence. The next step after that is you want to go ahead and close any new accounts that have been opened in your name. You want to work with your bank or whoever runs your account to remove bogus charges. And then, like Nikki touched on earlier, you want to go back and and correct your credit reports. So that's working with the three main bureaus, Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian to go in and make sure any negative credit reporting is fixed after you have frozen those those credit reports. And like I said earlier, there are more specific steps on the FTC website, identitytheft.gov, based on the specific scenario that you're in. So they have different steps for different types of identity theft that you may have experienced, whether it's credit card fraud, whether it's loan fraud, employment or tax-related fraud, government documents or benefits fraud. They've got specific steps for all of those. Um, and we're not gonna break those down today, but you can go to that website if you are a victim find which specific type of fraud applies to you, and then go into more detail about those specific steps. So we just wanted to thank you guys for joining us today. It's a little shorter episode um, because we just wanted to focus on this very important topic. Um, We encourage you to take some time to make sure your identity is safe. Really think about what you can do. Review your passwords, set alerts on your account. Can you commit to shredding? some of your documents, anything that you could think of to just make yourself a little bit safer when it comes to your identity. Stay tuned for our next episode. We're going to move on from financial technology to a new financial topic. We will have some special guests on to help tackle that important topic, but make sure you also subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or Google Play so you never miss an episode. And thanks for joining us.